If Jan van Eyck was the superstar of the Northern Renaissance, Roger van der Weyden comes in a close second. I'm going to show you the bottom central panel of Van Eyck, Ghent altarpiece again, and then return to this slide. Here's the worship of the lamb. And now we're back to the van der Weyden. What differences do you see between the two works? Well, this is a much shallower, more tightly composed work. It is not set in a realistic space, either interior or exterior. Instead, it's set in a golden box-like shape that almost seems filled with painted sculpture. The figures show much more emotion, although in fairness, it's a much more emotional subject. But this composition also shows much more movement and fluidity. The composition is rhythmic. Uh, by that term, art analysts mean that the artist employs repeating lines, shapes, and forms. Good term to be able to use in an essay. Note how the curved body of Christ is echoed by the fainting Mary and how their arms and hands form parallel lines and parallel curves. So what similarities do you see between Van Eyck's and Van der Weyden's works? You may be getting tired of this phrase, but like all Flemish works of this period, Van der Weyden is a master of detail. This is more than just a technical accomplishment or a reflection of oil paint's qualities. Northern Renaissance painters, more than their Italian Renaissance counterparts, invited the viewer into a work of art. They invite us really to enter an exquisitely rendered universe and to become, or at least to feel, a part of it. Remember the turn to a more personal piety that characterized this era and will continue to be a central feature of the Reformation. This is its artistic echo. It's hard to capture this experience just from slides, by the way. So go see some of this work in the flesh, okay? And speaking of the flesh, here you see not just the parallelism of the hands, but the exquisite realism, really painful realism of van der Weyden's rendering. Remember that this is a very large work, which you can check out at the Prado in Madrid, by the way, possibly my favorite European art museum. I just visited this painting again in November, sigh. Anyway, these details were so large so that they would be very visible to worshipers. Let's take a little closer look at some of the figures and the ways their faces and bodies express their profound sorrow. Here's an even closer look, this time at St. John and the woman accompanying him, who is probably one of the Marys. Note her red nose and his anguished expression. This altarpiece, which is also by Roger van der Weyden, was commissioned for a hospital that specialized in treating skin maladies. Obviously, it's hard to pick out much detail on this slide, but you'll note that the artist has used hierarchy of scale to indicate relative importance. There are still medieval elements in Northern Renaissance painting. So here we see a detail, some of the damned writhing in pain and terror. And note, by the way, the superb color of the oil painting. And here, too, is an exquisitely rendered St. Michael. What's he doing? You've seen this in uh, Tympanum. He's weighing souls to determine their ultimate fate. Notice the careful shading on his robe, the multicolored and highly textured wings, and again, the artist's use of hierarchy of scale. Well, are you beginning to OD on altarpieces? This one's a bit of an anomaly since it was made by a Flemish painter for a Florentine patron, the head of a Medici bank in Bruges, and he bought it for a Florentine church. It was the descriptive realism, the exhaustive detail, and the atmospheric richness of the oil medium that wowed the people of Florence. This was a very, very influential work, not just because it's a great work of art, but because this was the first major oil painting that people saw in Florence. Uh, it encouraged Italian painters to explore the potential of oil paint and to pursue greater naturalism in their painting. Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, Tisch, and all of our high Renaissance biggies were very influenced by this kind of Northern Renaissance art. Here's a bit of a close-up. We see the patron's wife and daughter kneeling before their patron saints, who again are depicted as much larger using hieratic scale or hierarchy of scale. But note too the wintry landscape, more typical of Flanders than Italy. The central panel depicts the adoration of the shepherds, and note how unidealized these shepherds are and how much more personality they convey. This too deeply impressed Italian artists who flocked to see this altarpiece. 
I've mentioned that Flemish painters loved symbolism. The flowers in this exquisite still life were chosen very carefully for symbolic value. So violets symbolize humility. Lilies and iris symbolize the passion. Lilies also symbolize virginity and Mary. Columbine symbolizes the Holy Spirit, and the three red carnations are nail flowers. They symbolize the nails of the cross. Okay, believe it or not, last altar piece for now. So what elements of this altarpiece central panel seem typical of the Northern Renaissance? Well, you have a domestic setting, you have a crowded scene, you have richly portrayed textures, a lot of expression on the faces, but there's something different as well. Can you figure out what it is? This comes closer than any of the paintings we've seen to capturing mathematical perspective. So here's another painting that uses domestic setting and symbols to combine secular and religious messages. The goldsmith may or may not be St. Elgius, who was a goldsmith before entering holy orders and bringing Christianity to Flanders. But note especially the meticulously drawn jewels and other elements of the goldsmith skill. Some of the objects portrayed were used in mass. Others were for personal adornment symbolizing the goldsmith's combined secular and religious duties. So here's kind of a trick question. How does this and other Northern Renaissance paintings differ from international style Gothic in its treatment of gold and jewels? They're, both kinds of paintings are filled with them and with very elegant uh, costumes. Well, the answer is that painters like Gentile di Fabriano and Simone Martini used actual gold to produce a gold shimmer. Van Eyck and other Northern Renaissance painters accomplished this with layer upon layer of oil. And by the way, as you might expect, this reduced the uh, price of painting a lot. It made it more affordable by the middle class. Well, I promised we would turn to portraits, and here we go. This portrait, really a favorite of mine. I, the portrait is a paint as a painting which was made just to be a portrait as opposed to a portrayal of a king or a pope or the donors of an altarpiece begins to appear in the early 15th century with some of the earliest examples found in Northern Europe. Although you remember we saw some of them in the early Renaissance as well, such as the portrait of the Duke of Urbino uh, um, that uh, we heard an essay about. So the rising wealthy merchant class of Flanders and Burgundy craved portraits in the new medium of oil, and their practical down-to-earth attitudes fit in well with Van Eyck's realism. Van Eyck, one of the greatest portraitists in art history, was far less likely to glamorize his subjects than most other artists. Note that in this painting, which is probably but not certainly a self-portrait, he's left in the stubble, and he has he's portrayed a bloodshot eye. So what else is different about this portrait? The subject is looking directly at us. Art historians uh, speculate that Van Eyck painted Van Eyck painted himself by looking directly into a mirror. And according to your textbook, this was the first portrait with a subject gazing directly forward at the viewer in a thousand years. Let's return to our video for a discussion of portraits in Northern Renaissance art. So contrast uh, this the artist's direct stare in the Van Eyck self-portrait with this woman's less direct gaze. Now, your textbook includes an altarpiece by Hans Memling, but not this portrait. I'm going to go in the opposite approach. I've included this not only because Memling was especially famous for his portraits, but also because this painting captures the look of the well-to-do Flemish townswoman of the final decades of the 15th century. Note her almost nun-like appearance, a pale face, severely swept back hair, her starched, transparent headdress and dark clothes. She poses as if deep in devout musings. Her hands are clasped primly together. The background is barely distinguishable now from her close-fitting dark purple dress, uh, but that's actually because its original bluish-green background color is darkened. The Memling portrait also presents an interesting comparison and contrast with Roger van der Weyden's portrait of a lady. Like his altarpieces, van der Weyden's portraits are more idealized, less naturalistic than either Memling's or Van Eyck's. I also find this lady's expression more mysterious, and therefore more interesting. With those full red lips, is she really thinking pious thoughts? Note that both portraits employ angular lines and note the amazing way that multiple layers of translucent oil paint enables artists 
forward is to render these almost transparent veils. And now we come to one of the most famous paintings in art history and a college board favorite. The Arnolfini portrait is one of the most famous paintings in Western art, and it's a painting that has stimulated a great deal of argument. It's even undergone a name change. It was originally called the Arnolfini Wedding Portrait, or previously called that. In fact, the focus of interpretive disputes has been the question of whether the painting documents a marriage, a betrothal, or it's better understood just as a double portrait, falling in the class of court portraits. Van Eyck was a noted portrait painter for the royal court, a factor which gives credibility to the idea that this might just be a double portrait. We see many typical Northern Renaissance elements. So what are they? I know I'm repeating that question a lot, but it's the kind of question the College Board will ask. So we have a domestic setting. We have rich colors. We have a careful portrayal of texture, colors that are both dark and glowing produced by oil paint. Also typical of Northern Renaissance art, the portrait is packed with symbols. So for example, the removed shoes are a, are a symbol of the sanctity of the scene. The candelabrum with just one candle burning may symbolize the unity of marriage, while the mirror symbolizes purity. The still life of fruit has been interpreted as symbolizing the innocence of life before Adam and Eve ate the fruit. It's also been interpreted as symbolizing this is a very wealthy guy who can afford expensive fruit. By the way, since I made last year's podcast on the Northern Renaissance, I've learned a new theory about this painting. Evidence has emerged that the woman in the painting may have actually died before it was completed. So maybe the single extinguished candle symbolizes death, but not everyone agrees with this new interpretation. Whether the painting portrays a wedding, a contract, or simply a double portrait, it is clear from this image in the mirror that witnesses were present, and one apparently was the painter himself. The inscription reads, Jan van Eyck was here. I don't know how much time you will have left, but I'm hoping you'll be able to watch at least some of a fun video on the Arnolfini portrait. In your notes template, I've included one of the summary slides that I adapted from another teacher. I recommend that you study it. I'm not going to show it here.